Good morning. Well, it is a great pleasure to be back in the Riverside Church. Uh, for the five years when I was first out of college, when I was a cub reporter at the New Yorker magazine writing the talk of the town, it was my great privilege to be a member here. Um, I know that this pulpit has seen many great orations. For me, it will always be the place where Bill Coffin preached about the death of his son uh, a, a few days after it had happened, after he died in an accident. Um, I know that most people know this church best during these ringing hours of music and oratory on Sunday morning. As Reverend Phelps said, I actually know it best late at night. Um, in those years with, with Mary Burton, who you just heard from, and our friend Shirley Goltz, we started the, the homeless shelter that operated for many years downstairs. Um, I dare say I've slept more nights in this church than most people. And though I've been away for many years, I've followed your progress in particular. It was a great privilege to get to know Reverend Forbes just a little bit and, and to be able to read his incredibly eloquent words. Now, as Reverend Phelps points out, it wasn't particularly easy to get permission to open that shelter. It took a little politicking with the choir because it was their space that we took over, but it took more politicking with Reverend Coffin, um, who some of you may from that time recall could be a somewhat stubborn man. Um, when I first proposed it, I remember him saying, no, at Riverside we don't do charity, we do justice. But we convinced him there wasn't a necessary divide between the two, that as people volunteered to spend the night in the shelter, they'd turn into effective advocates for dealing with the roots of the crisis. And I hope that some will leave here today willing to be strong advocates in this new fight, a fight for our very survival. In 1989, not long after I'd left New York, I wrote the first book for a general audience about climate change. It was called The End of Nature, and it was in part a piece of reporting about the science of what we then called the greenhouse effect, but it was also a philosophical essay, a piece of lay theology. I drew heavily on the book of Job in the Hebrew Bible, which is the first and perhaps the greatest piece of nature writing in the Western canon. But it's also the first modern story in the Bible, the first without an easy and obvious moral tale at the end. You all know the story. Job is a good man, but he finds himself cursed by God. His flocks and his family die. He finds himself living on a dung heap on the edge of town, covered by oozing sores. His friends come to visit. They try to calm his woe by explaining that he must somehow have sinned and earned this punishment. But Job will have none of it. Um, his pain consists of knowing that he was a good man. And over 37 chapters, he demands that God appear and account for his suffering, which as it turns out, falls into the category of be careful what you wish for, because at the 38th chapter, God does appear, speaking out of a tornado. And he gives what is his longest soliloquy in the Bible, Old Testament or new. It is on the one hand, very beautiful, a tour of the vast natural world from the morning stars to the gazelle, from the edge of the ocean to the eagle's nest, but it is delivered in a sarcastic, taunting voice as if God is annoyed at having been bothered for an explanation. If you're so smart, he tells Job, where do you keep the thunderstorms? Can you whistle up a blizzard? Do you tell the proud waves here you shall break and no further? And Job, of course, has to answer as all mortals for all time. No, he says, that's your department. I can't actually make the weather. You are big and I am small. Uh, can I sit down now? Basically, that's what he says. Or rather, Job has to answer as all mortals did up until our time, because all of a sudden, we've gotten rather large. Our first 
sense of that sudden change in stature came with the detonation of the first atom bomb at Alamogordo in the New Mexico desert. J. Robert Oppenheimer, watching the mushrooming cloud, quoted from the Gita, from the Hindu scripture, we are become as gods, destroyers of worlds. But the images of those blasts at Hiroshima and Nagasaki were enough to persuade us, so far at least, to go no further down that path, thank God. We could imagine the horror of those titanic explosions. We, so far, have not been able to adequately imagine the effect of the explosion of billions of pistons in billions of cylinders every minute of every hour of every day, but those explosions are wrecking the Earth just as surely and almost as fast as nuclear war. Consider that so far, human beings have burned enough coal and gas and oil to raise the temperature of the planet one degree Celsius. That's the equivalent of about three quarters of a watt of extra solar energy per square meter of the Earth's surface, which doesn't sound like much, less than one small white Christmas tree light per square meter. But it turns out that there are a lot of square meters on the surface of the Earth, and so the heat the extra heat trapped by the carbon that we have poured into the atmosphere is the energetic equivalent of exploding 400,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs every day. That's been enough energy so far to melt the Arctic. The latest satellite data shows that 80% of the summer sea ice that covered the North when, say, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon and looked down on our planet, 80% of that is gone. We've taken one of the largest physical features on Earth and we've broken it, and with the others not far behind. The oceans are now 30% more acidic, and the chemistry of seawater changes as it absorbs carbon from the atmosphere, and that makes it very hard for all those things at the very bottom of the marine food chain to make their living. The atmosphere itself, because warm air holds more water vapor than cold, is now 5% wetter than it was 40 years ago, which loads the dice for drought and for flood. These are the signs of our times, and you can see where I'm going. When God taunts us, we no longer have to back down. Unlike Job, we can answer him right back. Do you set a barrier to the oceans, saying here to the proud waves, you shall break and no further? Job has to stay quiet, but we can say, sure, you old geezer, waves are us. So far, we've raised the sea level of the Atlantic off New York a foot. And we found out last October when Sandy filled the subway tunnels of this greatest cities with salt water, what that means. When Sandy came up the coast, it set the mark for the lowest barometric pressure ever recorded north of Cape Hatteras and for the widest wind field ever observed by satellite. But it wasn't, to use the language of Job and of the insurance companies, an act of God. It was an act, at least in part, of us, an act not just stupidi of stupidity, but an act of blasphemy. And crucially, an act carried out against the least among us. Hurricane Sandy killed a lot of people in New York, but it killed more people in Haiti. The drought last summer in this country caused a lot of trouble for farmers and food prices, grain prices went up 30 and 40 percent. But for most of us, we can deal with it. The price of a box of cornflakes, you pay more for the box than you do for the corn. But if you live someplace where you have to get together your coins each morning at the market to buy enough cornmeal to make tortillas for your family for dinner, rest assured that a 30% increase in the price of corn because of our drought last year was the biggest thing that happened to you. This is the largest social justice issue that we have ever faced. When we founded this group called 350.org five years ago that's grown into the biggest um, grassroots environmental campaign ever, we set to work around the world. So far, we've held about 20,000 rallies in every country on Earth except North Korea. But the very first one of those, and I won't ever forget it, was 15,000 young people in the streets in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. 
When I started this work, one of the things I'd always heard was that environmentalism was something for rich white people who had taken care of their other problems, and if you worried where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist. What we've found as we worked around the world is exactly the opposite. Rich people tend to feel themselves immune from these changes. Most of the people that we work with around the world are poor and black and brown and Asian and young because that is what most of the world consists of. And, and what do you know? Those people care as much about the future as anybody else, maybe more so, because if you are poor in this world right now, the future bears down harder on you than it does on anybody else. To use Bill Coffin's formulation, this is not about charity. And it's not even really about justice. It's about something deeper than that. It's about solidarity, human solidarity. That future will bear down harder yet. As I said, so far we've raised the temperature one degree. But the same scientists who told us that would happen have shown quite clearly that that one degree will be four or five by century's end unless we act very swiftly to get off coal and gas and oil. And the logical question is, why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we trying to make ourselves somewhat smaller? Why aren't we following, say, the lead of Germany, the only major country that's really pursued, pursued renewable power at an appropriate pace? There are now more solar panels in Bavaria than there are in the United States. There were days last summer when Germany generated more than half the power it used from solar panels within its borders, and this is Germany. Munich is north of Montreal. Think what a country could do if it had, oh, I don't know, Florida or Nevada or Texas or California or Arizona to work with. But we don't act, and for a particular reason, one that will be clear to those who are used to reading the Gospels. Our richest people don't want to act because it would reduce their wealth somewhat. The fossil fuel, the fossil fuel industry, the fossil fuel industry is the one percent of the one percent, the richest enterprise in human history. Exxon made more money last year than any company in the history of money. There are far more eminent theologians than me in this room. I'm not a theologian at all, but it is my firm belief that these companies have more money than God, okay? And, and so far, they have been able to deploy those funds in political ways to make sure that nothing ever changes. They have bought in our nation's capital and many others a 25-year bipartisan effort to accomplish nothing, which is why I was thinking, of that parable about the rich young ruler who came to ask how he should behave. Jesus told him to sell what he had, to give it to the poor, to follow him, and we are told he went away grieving in the translation we had today, or from the King James, that he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, in some ways, all of us are the rich young man, for in comparison to the rest of the world, we have great possessions, and we've been too willing to hang on to them. But in this case, I think, the story really is about our rich rulers. It's not that Americans are addicted to fossil fuel. Most of us would be just as happy if our power came from the sun and the wind, if our cars ran on electricity. The addicts, and remember, I ran a homeless shelter, so I know a little bit about addicts, are the folks who run the fossil fuel empire, addicted to profits so great that they turn away sorrowful from the knowledge that they're wrecking the future. I say this with some consciousness of where I stand in the church built by John D. Rockefeller, the greatest oil baron that there ever was. But of course, of course he knew nothing of climate change. And though no saint, he was a complicated man, the pioneer not only of monopoly capitalism, but also of professional philanthropy, his wealth put to good use uh, in, in, in science, in education, and of course, in uh, no small part, this great edifice and all that it has meant to the world. His successors at the head of the fossil fuel industry are simpler. The man who runs the company he founded today, the CEO of Exxon, finally admitted for the first time last summer that global warming was real and caused by carbon emissions. But he said it was an engineering problem with engineering solutions. Asked what he meant, he explained, if we need to move our crop production areas, we will. This is wrong. 
crop production areas are what most of us call farms, and we already have them wherever we can grow anything. It is true that Exxon is helping now to melt the tundra, but that does not mean that if we make it to, too hot to grow corn in Iowa, as we did last summer, that we can simply move the whole operation north to Siberia. We can't. There's no soil. No. The Exxon CEO made plain the reason for his unwillingness to change in a second interview a few weeks ago with Charlie Rose, who asked him his philosophy. This commercial descendant of John D. Rockefeller thought for a second, but he didn't come up with any of the kind of formulations that Rockefeller might justly have come up with. He just looked at the camera and said, my philosophy is to make money. That's an apt summation of too much of our society. But here in this place, we have to stand in some counterpoint. Our goal must be to make real the gospel with its injunction to love our neighbors, not to drown them, not to sicken them, not to make it impossible for them to grow crops, but to love them. Which is why, which is why, which is why it is so fitting that many denominations are starting to join with colleges and universities around the country to divest their stock holdings in fossil fuel companies. This divestment drive is designed less to bankrupt the industry, we can't do that, but more to take away their social license, to keep them from being able forever to overpower science with money and with political favor. If it's wrong to wreck the climate, then it's wrong to profit from that wreckage. And to say that, to say that out loud is an important first step in dealing with the problem that we find ourselves in, the crisis. Already, four colleges have divested their holdings. 340 more, including Columbia and Barnard on your borders, have active campaigns underway. I was with students at Barnard yesterday, and it was great fun. Already 11 cities, including Seattle and San Francisco, have divested their holdings. Their mayor said, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to build seawalls now to try and protect our cities. Why would we be investing in the companies that make this work necessary? Just last week, the Uniting Church of Australia, the largest Protestant denomination in that country, voted to divest its stock despite the overwhelming power of that country's coal mining companies. Now, I know because I was here that Riverside divested quickly from its stock in apartheid-tainted companies in the 1980s. And it was very important that that happened. 155 colleges around the country divested. When Nelson Mandela got out of prison, the first trip he took was to the United States, and he did not go first to the White House. He went first to the University of California to say thank you to students who had forced the divestment of $3 billion worth of stock. And he said, of course, we fought for our own liberation in South Africa, but in this connected world, nobody does anything by themselves. It took pressure, too, from the rich places in the world to help make that fight happen. And I was reminded of that this fall when we were starting up this divestment campaign because we got a wonderful video from Mandela's old colleague who's been one of our advisors at 350.org from the beginning, Desmond Tutu, um, probably the most eminent churchman uh, on this planet. Um, and, and, and what he said in that video was simple. He said, if you could see what climate change is doing now to Africa, if you could see the famine and the drought that now plague us through no fault of our own because we've not been burning that fossil fuel, if you could see that, then you would understand why I ask you again to take up the same tactic that you took up a quarter century ago to divest and to put pressure on the companies that are at the root of this trouble. This campaign alone will not win the fight to guard creation. It's many other movements and parts of this fight are needed and we're fighting on all of them. Some of us will have to go back to jail and I've now spent enough 
nights in jail not to say those words lightly. Others with a gift for engineering will have to build out the new renewable infrastructure. There's work for everyone to do and more than enough, though, and this is the hard part, it comes with no guarantee that we will win. That's the difference in a way between this fight and others. You know, people in the civil rights movement had to be far braver than we're having to be at the moment. At least for now, no one's shooting you for talking about climate change. But Dr. King always had one thing going for him, which was absolute confidence that he was gonna win. He's always said, you remember the speech he gave the night before he was shot? I have been to the mountain like Moses, and though I may not make it across the Jordan, I have seen a cross and I know what lies on the other side. You remember what he always said at the end of speech is the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. This may take a while, but we're gonna win. In this case, it's different. Um, the arc of the physical universe is short and it's bending toward heat and doing it very rapidly. If we don't win this fairly quickly, then we will not win it at all. We've waited a long time to get started. The momentum of physics is very large. Having lost the Arctic, we have no room for complacency. But we do have room for faith. The pleasure of bringing this message to church comes from the hopeful feeling that one's allowed to summon here, a feeling one can't rightfully raise in a science classroom or in a policy think tank. Here we're allowed to believe that if we do all that we can, if we do better than that rich young ruler and, and think beyond our bank books, if we do all that we can, then we're allowed to believe that God, even that grumpy and sarcastic God of Job's whirlwind may still be willing to meet us halfway. Let us pray that that is the case, and then let us get to work. Amen. Mm.